the mayor and city council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. The council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Patena. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember, sorry, Council Liaison Johnson. Here. And Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Thank you, good evening, and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of December 4th, 2018. The first item on our agenda is a presentation. This is a presentation of the Mayor and Council's Youth Artist Program. And we were just fortunate enough to be able to uh, have a reception in another room in City Hall here and to see all of the artwork up close and meet some of the parents and some of the teachers who had um, their say in helping these students to be so creative and to impart some of their beautiful artwork on City Hall and everybody who visits City Hall for the last month. So we are proud to be able to give them an award this evening. And um, I would like to ask our uh, Youth Council liaisons, Johnson and Gilbertson, to um, go to the floor and make the presentations to these students for their wonderful artwork. We are so honored to have you at our City Council meeting this evening. Thank you for being here. program. Uh, at this time, we will be calling students in groups based on schools. When you hear your name, please come down to receive your certificate and stand for a group photo. Uh, from Oasis Elementary School, Joash Esmus, uh, Ramses Morales, and uh, Ella Rollins. <laughs> Uh, from Peoria Elementary School, Raven Squires, Emily Tran, and Austin White. From Park Ridge Elementary School, Lily Chavez, uh, Rachel Whitmer, and Carly Rose.
uh, from Peoria Traditional School, Ashley Reagan, uh, Annabelle Barrier, and Nicholas McGuire. From Santa Fe Elementary School, Kylie Raven, uh, Miguel Villacana, and Olivia Pera. From Sun Valley Elementary School, Andrew Cabarellis, uh, Don Hoang, and Trinity, Trinity Glidewell. From Skyview Elementary School, Alexander Haza, Quincy Johnson, and Aveline Cullen. Uh, from Sunset Heights Elementary School, Levi Rubenstein, Caden Ness, and Matthew Banowicz. Uh, from Zuni Hills Elementary School, Josh Evans, Jax Novak, Novak uh, and Estelle Farnsworth. Uh, thank you all once again for participating in this program. Thank you to the parents and the kids. And I want to remind you that this is being televised. So your children are on TV getting their awards. You can watch it on Channel 11 or you can stream it on your computer. So congratulations again. Surprise. <laughs> Okay, we will now move on to our next item on the agenda, and that is the AFSCME Annual Update and Day of Giving, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Thank you all for being here this evening. And just so, would, would you, who, who is leading our, we are, our program? Our, uh, 
Leslie's going to speak for us on this day of giving. That just It's on your screen now where we performed at this uh, last year, 2017. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? My name is Walter Crenshaw. I'm the current president of Madison. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Good evening, council and staff. My name is Walter Crenshaw. I'm the current president of ASPE Local 3282. And beside me is Leslie McMorrow, a member of ASPE, Vice President Eric McMorrow. Today, they're going to present to you uh, our ASME Annual Day in Review and the Day of Giving. Thank you. Thank you. Today, we would like to begin with our last event in 2017 for our year in review. The Day of Giving was a partnership between ASME, city employees, Peoria businesses, and community leaders. Items were provided to local families free of charge to help bridge the gap of what might be missing during the holiday season. Those items included clothing and shoes, toiletries, non-perishable pantry items and baby food, diapers, toys, and stocking stuffers. There was also free food and hot cocoa, music, activities for the kids, including face painting and cookie decorating, and even a visit from Santa for the young and the young at heart. As you can see, we had multiple departments that represented the city take part of this as well. And we would like to give a great group of sponsors, a quick thank you for making the Day of Giving possible last year. Some of the other groups and activities that AFSME donated time and money to include donating 15 dog crates and bottled, bottled water to Soldier's Best Friend for an upcoming training session, $2,000 towards laptops and technology purchases for the Heart Pantry, a local nonprofit, as well as a back to school supply drive that benefited the entire third grade of Paradise Honors Elementary School in Surprise. We would also like to introduce those of you who may not know to Isabel Siqueiros. She's a two year old Peoria resident who was in need of a new heart. Her parents found this out just days after her second birthday in January. ASME participated and helped sponsor multiple fundraisers and events throughout the year to help Isabel and her family with this trying time. There's no sound. Do you have sound? The Siqueiros family had their world turned upside down after learning their two-year-old daughter, Isabel, needed a heart transplant. Their HOA threatened to fine the family over the paint touch-ups there, so PPG Paints donated that paint and supplies, and the city workers stopped by on their own time to help this family out. Everybody in the community getting together loves seeing stories like that. As you can imagine, we were most proud of being on TV. <laughs> We cannot thank the volunteers and the sponsors enough who helped us with Isabel's cause. Additionally, more closer to home, AFSME donated $500 to the Peoria Community Center to help expand its Nerf War games. They wanted to go monthly instead of just yearly, and they wanted additional materials to create more interesting barriers for the kids to expand their experience. Additionally, the Relief Squad group of business leaders also provided barriers, although not much labor to put them together. So you can see us putting them together the night before. However, kids of all ages took part in the fun. And we do mean all ages. <laughs> That's not funny. That's not funny. <laughs> Peoria employees were also invited to bring their families for a catered picnic, door prizes, and a day of fun at Wet n Wild Park to celebrate Labor Day. And just for a couple of notes, Isabel has received her transplant. She had her transplant surgery last May. 
She has been experiencing some ups and downs, but overall she is making very good progress. For anybody who would like to follow her progress, they can look for A Heart for Isabel on Facebook. They post very regularly. Additionally, the second annual Day of Giving is coming up December 16th. The community is invited to the Peoria Community Center from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. December 16th. The address is on your screen. There will again be toys, food, clothing, Santa. We are also going to have cookie decorations again, as well as gift wrapping, face painting, bounce houses, almost anything you can imagine for a day of fun. So please feel free to come on out and enjoy. I'd like for you to notice something on that sign, that last sign that we just passed up. You know, this is the city of Peoria joined in that sponsorship and helping support here in the community. I love the honor and the respect that you've shown for your community and helping support in the day of giving. Thank you. Well, we can say the very same to you. Thank you so much for all that you have done for Peoria. Oh, this is just one year. It's incredible, the work that you've done and the impact that you've had. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the presentations of certificates to newly appointed board and commission members. And I would like to ask Vice Mayor Mike Finn, uh, who is the chair of the council subcommittee for boards and commissions to uh, meet me on the chamber floor. You want a microphone? Oh, wow. Okay. I guess I am on my own. Um, so anytime that I get to uh, hand these out, I like to take an opportunity to thank everyone that uh, volunteers on our boards and commissions and help, uh, help us kind of gain a little bit better insight from the public. Um, they're not paid well at all <laughs> to volunteer their time, but we should, sure do appreciate the fact that they come out and they help us with uh, some of the tougher decisions that we have. And um, it's always an honor to, to recognize them and appreciate all the things that they do. So um, these are some of our, um, our newly appointed board members. And I'm gonna start with uh, Danette Dunn, who was appointed to the Planning and Zoning Commission. So if, come on down, Danette. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Monica Masiangelo for the Citizens Commission on Salaries for Elected Officials. <laughs> Next, we have Kathleen Patterson, Board of Adjustment. Next on the Youth Advisory Board, we have Ratika Ravindran. <clears throat> Next is Aaron Streeter, Citizens Commission on Salaries for Elected Officials. Next on the Youth Advisory Board, we have uh, Sanvi Tawari. <laughs> and 
And finally, Christopher Wedigen for the Youth Advisory Board. I'm digging the bow tie, I'm not gonna lie to you. Nice work. <laughs>
City of Peoria and Phoenix have been partners in the recycling business for quite some time. We are currently have an existing intergovernmental agreement that provides uh, terms and conditions for bringing our recycled material to Phoenix uh, MRF and they uh, accepting those. Again, now with the market change, we went from a condition where the city used to get paid for the recycled materials to now we are looking at actually having to pay to take those. Um, however, through reinvesting in some of the technology, we think we can get back on that path to at least breaking even, if not uh, hopefully get back in the positive. The City of Phoenix is looking at reinvesting in that sorting technology. It's about a $4 million project that'll have things such as better magnets, infrared, sorters, opticals, that really sort that equipment faster and, and more predictable or consistently uh, each time. This, pardon me, this becomes a really important uh, element and I'll talk about the, the pros of that in just a moment. As part of the deal, Peoria would be investing $1 million of its solid waste development impact fee. These are some fees that were collected a number of years ago associated with growth just for this kind of condition where we have a change in fixed costs that really address, that affect how we provide the service to the citizens of Peoria. So when we look at that, the, the power of this agreement, there's really two sides to it. One is the better market position. Uh, again, by having this technology and a better uh, sorting, we get a greater volume of, of marketable products. So um, we're speeding up the conveyor belt again and we're getting that 99.5% pure, we're getting a lot more volume that is now able to be sold and there is a market for it because it is in that condition. Second, they're moving faster than most of the market and should have this installed by October of 2019. And this is a, a solution that a number of folks are looking at across the country. Uh, Phoenix happens to be ahead of the curve on this, and so this is a good opportunity for us. The other benefit here from a market position is that uh, the city of Phoenix actually contracts with Republic Services to operate their MRF, and they have a very uh, favorable agreement through 2021, and as being a partner with them, we get those favorable terms as well. Uh, so that's particularly helpful. And then last, Phoenix also has some very strong relations with the purchasers of recycled material. Uh, it's, it's an interesting business and there's very few companies who actually purchase that recycled material and then take it to China or these foreign markets for uh, resale. So they have a very good relationship which helps us better understand what's the commodity, what's the demand uh, as the market changes. But the icing on the top really is not only are we making this investment and getting us in a better position long term, we're actually getting a full payback plus of that $1 million investment. Uh, we will receive $1 million in credits. Uh, and that is essentially, if it costs $20 a ton to take the recyclables, uh, we would get a $20 credit per ton up until we use the $1 million. So for the, first, for the next two years, we know that there would be no cost which is great because our business model assumes no cost. Um, so this is a very good uh, alternative. Years three through five, we're looking at reduced cost. But if the market changes in years three through five, we've actually negotiated a better cost sharing or revenue sharing arrangement. So right now, when it was in the positive, we split the revenue 50-50. In this new arrangement, Peoria will receive 75% of the revenue and Phoenix will receive 25%, again, until we reach this million dollar credit. And then the last piece is kind of just the interest on the million dollars, so to speak. They have offered to provide above market, uh, above market incentives to deliver materials with less contaminants. Again, this all starts with having as clean a product at the curbside as possible. And so they've offered incentives to, uh, in this agreement to get that contaminants down. So let's talk about that just a minute because part of this is going to be a recommitment uh, to the to reducing contaminants and we're starting we're already in season for a plastic bag challenge So I'm going to see if I can start this video with this. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Whoops Oh, yeah, that didn't do it at all Can you click on that uh, image the dark image there? Great yeah, and then just hit the start there. 
The city of Peoria is experiencing high contamination in the recycle can. This can ruin an entire recyclable load, and we need your school's help. The number one contaminant is plastic bags. Plastic bags can be recycled but need special handling and don't belong in the recycle can. The city of Peoria challenges your school to help participate in the plastic bag challenge. Help spread the word and collect plastic bags. The challenge starts November 15th and runs through April 15th, with the winner being announced on Earth Day, April 22nd. Check out our website, puraz.gov slash recycle for more details. And good luck. This is one of Becky's brain child and she's got us running already. Um, we've got 14 schools that are signed up and one school alone, if you see the other image there, Sunset Elementary has already collected 7,000 plastic bags. So you can see that's a huge diversion that really helps us on that contamination element. Uh, we also have another, a number of other initiatives. Uh, you're familiar with our uh, Peoria News Flash that our communication division does. We've put together a series of scripts that just give people hints on a weekly basis of these are things to put in your basket, these are things not to put in your basket. So we're hoping that just a little bit, a little bit at a time, will help with that contamination issue. We also will continue our inspection program, but we're moving towards something that I'm calling the three-tag checkup, and it's the idea of our inspector team uh, goes out and they actually open the bin when it's on the curbside. And if it's, hey, you, you got the right materials in the right bin, you get the, you know, the green tag or whatever, the, the, you're doing great tag um, that says keep on doing a great job. If you're kind of more in the middle where you've got a lot of good products in there but you've got some contaminants, uh, you'd get a second tag, kind of a middle grade tag. And we'd also knock on the door uh, try to make a reach reach out and ha have a discussion about hey if you can take some of these items out It gets us in a much better position uh, For this and then the third is that hey you've missed it entirely We've got more trash in here than recycling and so again. It's a tag. It's a knock on the door It's a door hanger and says hey um, Try try again, and uh, we'll come back uh, next time and, and see if you, you hit the mark so hopefully um, looking at that and doing more of those inspections will really get that personal touch where people are learning more and, and hopefully getting better uh, compliance with that. So we have, uh, we also have a number of other items. Uh, again, our amazing communications department has a whole list of public information items that we're going to reinforce going forward, but this is a, an important element to reduce contaminations. Um, so for tonight, we have two actions. One is to appropriate the million dollars in development impact fees, and the second is to approve the IGA with Phoenix. It's a five-year agreement. And then myself and my two colleagues are here. I've, I know about this deep of the information. They know the real depths of this uh, subject matter. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, do you have any questions? Yes, Council Member Hunt. <clears throat> when China and, and then especially Malaysia and Vietnam and those smaller countries that obviously don't have as much infrastructure or money available, when they buy our refuse, basically, our recyclables, what do they do with them, typically? Much of that material is recycled and made into plastics. Uh, I don't know if you have gone to some of the stores and... If you look at over on the back side of them, it's made in China. So we get a lot of the toys, a lot of the plastic bottles, again, brought over to us. Okay, what about those smaller countries, though? I never see made in Malaysia. We do, but they are, again, like uh, Kevin was saying, um, they were not the major purchasers. Okay. So their products are very limited compared to China. I guess I'm thinking back, and it's been many, many years where we found out that China was actually dumping electronics into the China Sea. Are any of you old enough to remember that? Uh, they were taking it, but they weren't recycling it. They were dumping it in the ocean. So we don't have any knowledge of them doing that. And, and two, what do they do when they refuse part of ours because it has pizza grease or something on it? What do they do with those? Well, of course, that goes to the trash. And that's the problem that we're having, that because it's contaminated, they are just refusing it. So it's come back it to us. Back. So we have to treat it as trash. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Edwards. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a question for you. So we, we have an initiative here uh, for, with the residents. Are we working with our businesses um, that that have the plastic bags uh, at the retailers? Are we working with them to, to try to curb their, their disbursement of those units? Well, um, there is some efforts. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that Fry's, for example, is hoping to completely get rid of plastic bags in the year 2020, 24. So there is small efforts, but as of right now, we there's no laws or bills uh, in place to take care of the plastic bags. Because I know a lot of other states, they have they they impose a, a fee for for the the use of the plastic bags. So that's, it, it helps promote uh, bringing your own, you know. Uh, uh, Gunny, not gunny sack, but a burlap sack or whatever you would uh, in place of plastic bags. That would really help us, but... <laughs> the state <laughs> actually prohibited local jurisdictions from doing that here. Okay. And, and one of our efforts... Yeah, one of our efforts is to give out a lot of the re reusable bags and encourage our residents to use them and take them with them to the store when doing their shopping. And the flip side is that those, uh, such as Walmart and the supermarkets, are the main... Uh, organizations that are receiving the plastic bags back. So that is one element as to the positive. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Well, I would really like to commend you on the value that you got for that, for our input for this million dollars. Not only are we helping to upgrade the equipment, but we are getting a credit back and, and it was impact fees that we acquired and, and saved over a period of time to have this in the first place. So thank you for your um, judicious use of our finances there. Uh, um, I really appreciate that, that you're doing everything that you can to help us in this situation. It is a bad situation and it's just terrible. You know, we were able to, to sell our recyclables for such a long time and keep our solid waste rates low. And now we're gonna have to make adjustments. Our citizens are gonna have to make adjustments. And so, you know, I, I, I also worry about the greater good, about people not recycling as much because um, they don't feel like they're getting the value for it. So. There is always that aspect that, that matters a lot. Um, I did want to say, or, or did want to ask one more question about the education piece. Are you sending out um, information to all of our residents in maybe the bills, the, the utility bills or anything, letting them know what is recyclable, what is not, how clean things need to be, what you need, what citizens can do? We do have our Sustain and Gain brochure, which is very popular. Mm -hmm. It's gonna go out in uh, January. So that has very detailed information. We also have our website. We are going to be sending out uh, in our billings uh, brochures and our social media. We have really stepped up on the social media, putting articles and the do's and don'ts of recycling. So yes, we are, we are doing efforts in that. Increasing I, our efforts. Yeah, it took a long time to get people up to, up to speed and feeling like they were comfortable with recycling, and I don't want them to feel now with these changes that they, you know, that, that all bets are off. That they don't still need to recycle. It's still a great thing to do. It's still great for, you know, ongoing uh, rates, and um, in, eventually this will come back, I think. You know, we'll be able to get uh, funds for it again at another time we want to just keep recycling it's the best thing to do for the greater good thank you guys Great. very much well, we appreciate you, it thank you. so um we're gonna vote now don't go yet <laughs> so council if there are no more no further questions do i have a motion a motion second. motion and a second please vote And it passes unanimously. Thanks very Thank much. You. Okay, next is a major general plan amendment, update to circulation plan, land use map, and chapters two and 14 of the Peoria general plan. Mr. Tyne. Yes, thank you. And again, we have uh, Chris Hawkus, our planning director, and Lori Deaver here to provide for this presentation. Great. Well, good evening, Mayor and City Council. So by way of introduction to my right, this is Lori Deaver. She's a principal planner with our department, currently the acting planning manager, and she's been the project manager for the general plan update. 
So tonight, um, with 15R, this is, um, we are very pleased to present this year's cycle of major general plan amendments. While this is one item on your agenda and we're gonna do one presentation, it's actually comprised of three separate cases. So at the end of our presentation, um, we'll, take, uh, we'll, we'll ask for three separate actions at that point. Um, these amendments, they're part of the larger multi-year effort to comprehensively update our general plan under the Plan Peoria AZ moniker that you've seen. Um, these amendments this year, we would characterize largely as housekeeping or refinement in nature, but what they do is they position us for the work next year, and you're gonna see much larger, more substantive amendments next year when we look at the updating the plan elements, um, introducing new land use categories, and distributing those land use categories throughout the city. So this work positions us for, us for that. So while I do characterize this year's amendments as housekeeping in nature, I don't want to minimize the amount of work that's been put in to get us to this position. Um, Lori has been living the general plan for the last year, year and a half or so, but she's also been joined by other people that I would like to recognize tonight. Um, Cody Gleason, he's in the audience. He's one of our senior planners. He's been heavily involved. I'd also like to recognize uh, Dina Lund, our city engineer, and her staff, namely uh, Chris Limka, our city traffic engineer. He's been uh, intimately involved, particularly with the transportation um, uh, amendment that we're gonna talk to you about tonight. So the general plan, um, what is the general plan? This is our, our foundational growth and policy document that guides growth and development decisions over the next 10 years and throughout build out. Um, it's a comprehensive document. There are 17 required elements under the statute and they deal with a number of different categories, everything from land use to housing to um, recreation and open space. They cover a lot of different categories. And it's the primary tool that we use to um, you know, look at uh, rezone and development decisions or capital improvement decisions and those types of things. We're unique in the state of Arizona in that we're the only state that re does require our general plan to be placed on the ballot. Um, it does, the state statute requires it to be updated at least every 10 years and uh, be uh, voter ratified at least every, well, same period, every 10 years or so. So we're working towards that effort. Uh, the general plan is a document that uh, we call it a living document, meaning it's a document that um, is uh, constantly updated, so it's responsive to change. We wanna, we wanna make sure that it's, it continues to be relevant. So therefore, we look at uh, major amendments every year, amendments that we can do to improve the uh, certain aspects of the general plan and, and keep it up to date with changes that occur, not only in our city, but some of the surrounding jurisdictions that might impact development within our city. So I mentioned uh, earlier the, uh, the amendment cycle. This is part of the larger multi-year effort that we're engaging in to, uh, that will result in a complete rewrite of our general plan. Um, the update effort, this is uh, come under again our moniker of Plan Peoria AZ for those in the audience or those watching. Um, as part of our general plan update, we do have a separate dedicated website to the general plan update. It's a website where you can go on, you can look at all the materials that have been updated. Um, of course, all of tonight's amendments are there as well, and they have been as, uh, during this process. So you can make comments and, and basically stay apprised as to the general plan amendment as it, as it continues. So setting the general plan, the larger update aside, tonight the focus is to look at three specific amendments as part of this year's cycle. So the first amendment, which I'll talk about in a minute, relates to our refinements to our circulation plan or our transportation plan, in other words. Our second amendment is uh, refinements to our land use map. And then our third amendment is supporting text in our land use and plan, uh, plan administration elements. So I'll go through the first amendment and then what I'll do is have Lori talk about the other two uh, plan amendments. Okay, so the first amendment pertains to our circulation plan. Um, this is a uh, amendment, or I should say, this is a uh, plan that depicts the existing roadway network in the city and also the desired roadway network for the future. It identifies the various linkages throughout the city and uh, depicts how we intend to move people, goods, and services as development occurs in the city. So the, the uh, circulation plan identifies uh, roadway classifications from collector and hire. So if you think about a, our transportation system, it's a hierarchy, the highest level or the largest type of road is what's called a limited access parkway, like a Lake Pleasant Parkway. The next level down would be uh, an arterial roadway like a Bell Road or a Deer Valley Road, and then the, the, the level down below that that collects traffic from neighborhoods and distributes it onto our system is called collectors, and those are things like Williams Road is an example of a collector. So everything from a collector and above is depicted on our circulation plan. The lower um, hierarchy roadways like local streets, those are not shown on the uh, circulation plan. Those are um, local decisions that are made as we see development cases come in so we can look at the, the specific context of, of that. 
Our last uh, comprehensive update to the circulation plan that was done in 2012. Uh, so with this amendment, what we're trying to do is capture changes that are reflective of some of the um, entitlements, uh, some of the amendments to entitlements that we've seen since that period. If you think about Northwest Peoria, we've looked at uh, amendments to uh, Vistancia, Lake Pleasant Heights, and Saddleback. So we're looking at some refinements to the circulation plan that um, align with the entitlements and approvals that were granted for those, uh, those, pro those projects. There's other refinements that we show too that are uh, relate to um, better information that we have on topography. Um, also, new roadways that have been constructed or modified as part of the city's capital improvement program. So those are also reflected on the map. And finally, there's changes that have occurred um, outside our jurisdiction. You know, growth that occurs in Surprise or, or Glendale or other parts, they impact our city and impact our roadway. So we continually meet with those uh, surrounding jurisdictions and make sure that our roadway uh, networks are aligned and consistent. In putting together the amendment, um, we've put together a couple of uh, supplemental exhibits. One's a uh, supplemental map that has a key that identifies the proposed 45 uh, changes, 45 linkages of changes. And we've also uh, put together a matrix that identifies um, each of the linkage that we're proposing a change and describes the nature of the change. Um, these are all in your packet. They've been uh, provided to the public uh, as part of the website and all the uh, materials uh, to date. Um, these documents are not part of the general plan per se, uh, but they're produced really to aid the reader in understanding the, the, the level of changes. As I indicated, most of these linkages are just to update uh, uh, conditions and entitlements. Probably the one substantive change I'll note for the uh, circulation plan is um, a, a linkage between uh, Vistancia and Saddleback Heights that takes one up to State Route 74. This is a long, um, kind of a long uh, proposed change. Um, both parties are now in agreement for that change. So that's part of this, this change to the system. So before I continue, I wanted to stop and pause and see if there are any questions on the circulation plan before we move forward to the next piece. Council, any questions? The Fastancia Boulevard change is okay. critical. It's great to see it. All right, so we'll now move to the second uh, amendment and I'll pass it over to Lori. Thank you, Mayor Council. It's a privilege to be here this evening. I will be uh, addressing the next two amendments starting with the land use plan update. So first, I'd like to direct your uh, kind of eyes, and for those in the audience and may not be familiar, uh, to the graphic over to the right-hand side. Uh, it's not a kind of mistake or a paint-by-numbers illustration, if you will, gone wrong. It's actually a very critical map called the land use map, and it's one of the most referenced documents that we use when talking about proposed development projects. So it really is a critical item when we do our analysis. So what does it really do? So in the general plan document, there are 22 land use categories that are defined. They talk about uh, residential, commercial, uh, employment in nature. And those categories are then graphically represented on this map. So there's a correlation between the categories in the, in the document and the, and the map on the, uh, in the illustration in front of you. Each of those categories is um, assigned a kind of a standardized uh, category, if you will. Yellow would be residential, red in nature would be a commercial, and they tell us what an appropriate use would be in that particular area. So as you go uh, and you look at the map, it's kind of a hodgepodge of colors, but it's more organic in nature than what we would see in a zoning district uh, classification. So in a zoning district, it would be defined by a particular property or parcel. Land use categories are more organic in nature and they can extend in, in larger areas, if you will. And it's not uncommon to actually have two or more categories on a particular project or parcel. So as we are looking um, at these particular uh, land use categories, uh, keep in mind that they're very um, organic in nature, cover a much larger area than actually the city limits. If you'll see, it, it covers the municipal planning area, which is, as Chris has talked about in previous presentations, it's kind of our sphere of influence. We not only kind of address what we would like to see in the vision, uh, the properties within the city limits, it also address, addresses properties adjacent to the community as well. So this is how the land use map, map actually kind of, kind of provides that influence, if you will, on adjacent properties within the limits. So there are uh, essentially one major uh, modification, and that is 
recognition of existing conditions tonight. Uh, first and foremost, that was our primary objective. Secondly, we did have two uh, property owners that asked for uh, changes in the land use map to reposition their parcels for uh, de possible development going forward. So let me kind of talk about those in more detail. As Chris mentioned, this was a time intensive and, and also a labor of love and going through. There is uh, quite a bit of imprecision uh, in the land use map in itself. And this is stemmed from a couple of different reasons. The first being we've had a provision within the general plan amendment that essentially did not require an amendment to occur when a rezoning case came forward. Uh, couple of that at the time with significant growth and the result is we've had a land use map that's pretty much out of date with what's on the ground existing today. And if you think back when the land use map was originally prepared, these polygons, these shapes, if you will, were prepared without using any sort of precision data or tools such as GIS, aerial imagery, and topography. We have a significant amount of environmental data uh, now that we've incorporated in uh, with our mapping. And what we have, the end result is something that is so much more precise much more accurate than what we could have had even 5, 10, 20 years uh, previously. It is a collaborative effort. I do want to give a shout out to both uh, our IT department, our uh, consultant, and to planning staff and actual other departments as well, because it was a very time intensive uh, labor of love going 250 square miles of looking piece by piece, parcel by parcel, to see if this map was correct, and we made finite adjustments here and there, so it's a much more kind of comprehensive package, if you will. And the amendments tonight, the, both map amendments, worked hand in hand. If there were, was a, an alignment adjustment uh, with the circulation, we had to address it in both the land use map as well. So both amendments, we were working in tandem together. So while it was a, tense, a, a time intensive and, and labor of love, we knew that we wanted to use the existing format as it is today. Uh, when we go forward with the 2019 amendment, we do anticipate highly modernized, easier to read mapping, but for the amount of effort that required for the update, we wanted to use the existing map style and format. So let me give you an example of what we're talking about. The illustration on the left is uh, what is currently uh, today. If you notice that the wa water category and the park open space category, right over the top of residential homes. And park open space is not where it needs to be in an environmentally sensitive area. So the illustration on the right is what it would look like um, after the update as well. This was a very uh, strategic and surgical uh, amendment and an update. We primarily focused on existing conditions, not on vacant property. So what you see on the left on the illustration is in fact all of the changes that we would be making with this map. When you roll those changes into uh, the larger picture on the right, those are how they merge together. And so at this point, I'd like to stop and see if there's any questions on the changes proposed. Council, have you analyzed this map? <laughs> Do you have any questions? <laughs> I think we're good to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. So on to amendment number three. So the first two amendments were regarding uh, map updates. The general plan is more than just maps. It's also text as well. And so chapter two and 14 is a part of uh, the GPA 18-04 uh, case before you this evening. I'll go into each of these chapters and the modifications uh, in individually, if you will, starting with chapter two, the land use element. It works in conjunction with the land use map. So as I talked about before, it identifies the land use categories. There are 22 existing categories within the general plan document. They are housed within chapter two. In addition, there's various tables and uh, density uh, tables in there talking about correlation and what lot sizes may be appropriate. So this evening for consideration we have uh, three sets of modifications if you will. The first is recognition of waterways, second is elimination of the percentages within the mixed use category, and the third is correlation refinement, so language um, being adjusted. And I'll go into those in more detail here. 
the waterway category. So the illustration that I showed you a couple slides back actually had waterway on the image itself. But it's not a defined category within the general plan right now. It's actually uh, contained within the park open space category. So if you would think about it, technically, Lake Pleasant, any of the canals, Desert Harbor, the lakes, and anything like that should be colored green. That doesn't necessarily make sense from both the reader standpoint and from an analysis standpoint. So what we are suggesting is to take that category, that subcategory out of park open space and make it its own uh, category. This way we actually define, recognize, and preserve those areas uh, better going forward so uh, development uh, would not be able to go in that particular area. So like Desert Harbor, the lakes, the canals, waterways, and floodways in this instance would be preserved. The next change we're asking for is the mixed use category. This one encompasses, um, if you hearken back to a recent case, uh, Sunrise Plaza was, uh, was changed to the land use category mixed use. Any project that's designated mixed use needs both a residential and a commercial component to it. The current general plan requires a minimum of 30% to a maximum of 60% of a residential component in that project. That range has been problematic for some projects wanting to come into the community. In particular, if an area would like to redevelopment, would like to redevelop in our more mature areas, they would need to have at least 30% residential being converted. That's been a challenge for them. Likewise, the 60% category maximum. We are suggesting instead of having that subjective number, we require both residential and commercial, but we do the independent analysis, make sure the amount of residential and commercial being proposed is um, makes sense for the area. It's compatible with the area and we're providing the appropriate transitions and mitigating the project as, it, as it's going along. So we're, we're still keeping the analysis. We're just allowing more mature areas to be able to take advantage and offer an array of uses potentially down the road should they wish to uh, develop. This will also occur um, as an incentive for infill pieces as well. They may be a, able to take advantage of more sustainable practices and kind of stepping towards a more Main Street uh, set of developments in certain commercial areas. So we are asking for that change. The last one um, that I wanted to touch on uh, this evening is with the correlation information. So. Uh, the city council and uh, staff has seen a number of smaller lot residential developments uh, coming into the community. And while it, that type of housing um, is greatly desired by the market, we are finding that these projects want to be located in primarily um, areas that are designated state density residential and low density residential. And the lot sizes being proposed do not necessarily um, are compatible, they're not necessarily compatible with the, the lot sizes for those particular uh, categories. For instance, if a proposal was coming forward with um, R16 or 6,000 square foot lots, we would traditionally see those as more of a medium density type of character rather than a low density character. And so what we are suggesting is if a project is coming forward in a category that's a state density residential or low density residential, the majority of the lots need to correspond with the minimum lot sizes that the general plan has called out. We're trying to use this mechanism as an interim condition to uh, ensure consistency of character between existing uh, surrounding neighborhoods and the proposal. It doesn't mean to say that an applicant cannot request smaller lots. They may need to do a land use uh, change, a map change at that point. They would need to provide additional narrative and talk about what mitigation measures or what uh, design techniques they're using to ensure compatibility with the surrounding community. So it's, much, it's an enhancement tool, if you will, in having the general plan land use map uh, be representative of the project itself and uh, 
be able to identify and ensure that we're having communities uh, that are good neighbors with each other. So moving forward, we're into chapter 14. This is the uh, plan administration section. Essentially what it does is talks about how we implement and administer the general plan. It identifies what we consider major amendments, minor amendments, and when you don't need to process an amendment, you can just go forward. We have uh, two amendments or two modifications in this. First one deals with when you have a roadway change, what would be considered a major amendment, what would be considered a minor amendment. The second piece is if a development is, or if an area is considered medium density residential, for instance, and then they wanted to put a low density residential product in there. Traditionally, we have not required an amendment in this case. But as the city's maturing, we have uh, less opportunities to provide diversity of housing. And in this instance, when they are reducing density, we are asking for additional justification from the applicant as to why that change would be appropriate in this particular instance. So we still go through the analysis as we do today. We would just have a very formal application to go along with it. So as it's, this, it's pretty much a seamless process. It would be the same information being pre presented to commission and to council for consideration. It's just more formal, if you will. So that takes us to the end of the Third Amendment. So going forward, each of, each of these three cases tonight are major general plan amendments, and they do have uh, statutory requirements from state law. So that requires additional process, if you will. First piece that we went through is this, what we call a 60-day review. So the packet of information which we did present um, online and through various forms is provided to local, state, and federal agencies for comment. They're allowed 60 days, and that needs to be received 60 days plus 15 days in advance of our first meeting. So it was transmitted on August 8th. The comments were due back October 8th. We received uh, two letters, first one from Luke Air Force Base, uh, saying it was our amendments were compatible with their mission, and the second one from the city of, of Phoenix, uh, and that would be uh, within your packet as well. We also presented this out to the public for comment. We provided uh, two open house meetings. We did have a total of eight people in attendance. We provided the information through website, digital media, and so forth, and we did receive uh, comments. Uh, we did tally those comments, provide them in an errata sheet where uh, we thought they were appropriate to be addressed in the update cycle, we did so, where we thought they were more long-term in nature, we kind of couch those, park those, if you will, and those are going to be taken up for consideration during the comprehensive rewrite. So we, we have kind of a split in, in comments. And so we did make refinements to some of the various maps and text because of the pu public comment that we did receive. And that's included in your packet. These are major general plan amendments, so slightly different from a public hearing side as well. We have two Planning and Zoning Commission meetings that were required. Those were held November 1st, 15th. There were no speakers from the public. So that kind of brings us to the conclusion, if you will. We believe these amendments being proposed tonight constitute an overall improvement to the city's general plan. Uh, they are in conformance with the goals, objectives, and policies of that plan, and we so believe that these <laughs> improve the usability of the general plan because, uh, for instance, they better recognize the existing conditions uh, that we have today. It's improved map accuracy for sure, and it's creating the framework essentially for what we need going forward with the comprehensive rewrite. So it is a, a critical item that we see. As Chris, as Chris mentioned, there are three cases before you for 15R, so we are, are asking for three actions. Uh, we are asking for concurrence with the Planning and Zoning Commission, recommendation and adopting three items, resolution 2018-126 for the update for figure 3.1 of, of the circulation map, 
Resolution 2018-127, that's the update for the land use map, and then Resolution 2018-128 for the text changes in Chapter 2 and 14. One particular item I'd just like to mention, which is highlighted in the box below. Because this is a major amendment, uh, an adoption of a, major, of a major amendment to the general plan does require an affirmative vote of at least two-thirds of city council. So for tonight's meeting, that would be five out of seven. So with that, it, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Council, any questions? Councilmember Binsbacher? Thank you. You just read my mind. I didn't even push the button yet. Um, I just, I don't have a question. I just want to say, I just want to congratulate everyone involved in this process. And I know it's an ongoing process. This general plan document is a living document, but so critical to the future of our city um, and how it guides us through this planning process and the land use maps and all of that. And there was an unbelievable public outreach um, and what everything that went into getting to this point and continuing along the way. I just want to say how grateful I am. I've learned so much from your department and I know every time I put constituents in front of any of you, they learn so much. But this is very, very important work to the future of our city and I just want to thank you so much for all that you've done and continue to do to make this a priority. Um, this is what builds beautiful cities that make sense and flow and this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Anyone else? Councilmember Hunt, are you? I was going to make a motion. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I will move that we adopt resolution 2018-126 of the circulation plan. Second. Wait. Oh. Do we have to do all these separately? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, council, please vote. One twenty-six passes unanimously. Now we need a motion and a second for one twenty-seven. Motion. Second. Council, please vote. And 127 passes unanimously. And I need a motion and a second for 128, please. So moved. Second. So please vote. And 128 passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. The work all continues. Your work on this. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is 16R, and we are going to hear 16R and 17R um, at the same time, and then we will vote on them separately. 16R is temporary ordinance establishing a 120-day pilot program for stand-up electric scooter sharing system. And 17R is contract, temporary operating agreement with Bird Rides, Inc. for participation in the 120-day pilot program for stand-up electric scooter sharing system. Mr. Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is a follow-up to a recent study session that we had had. Seen an escalation in motorized scooters throughout the city. These shared ride services can be very much a viable transportation alternative, but they can pose some challenges as well for our management of these. And so, uh, with that in mind, we've had a recent discussion, and, and uh, we have Jay Davies, our chief of staff, as well as Vanessa Hickman, our city attorney, uh, to present uh, a proposal uh, for the council to consider on this. Thank you. I'll pass it to them. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> Just a quick overview to get us to where we are tonight. <clears throat> of course, the initial bird launch we saw late September, early October. We brought that, as Jeff said, to a study session on November 13th, where we covered a variety of the issues related to this model. Uh, as an homage to that study session, we brought back the photo of Mr. Tyne's stunt double riding the, <laughs> the dockless bicycle there. 
Um, as a reminder, this particular model does touch on a number of our livability goals, including uh, efficient transportation, healthy neighborhoods, economic competitiveness, and arts, culture, and recreation. So we keep that in mind as we were putting these agreements together. Uh, and then lastly, uh, tonight, we will cover some recommendations. The first piece we're going to talk about uh, of the two, uh, we have a 120-day pilot program. Uh, I just want to clarify, when we spoke to you last about this, we discussed uh, the potential of a 90-day pilot program. As we were putting this together, we recognized that we were going to create a gap if we had both a 90-day pilot program and a 90-day temporary operating agreement. By that, what, what we mean is on the 91st day, uh, both of these would expire and we would find ourselves in a situation where we had nothing to regulate uh, the environment, uh, whether it's the current vendor or any other vendors, uh, they would be free to revert back to uh, really an unregulated environment with respect to this model. Uh, the remedy for that is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, the temporary operating agreement we will propose for 90 days, while the pilot program will be for 120 days, giving us an additional uh, 30 days to to compile data and bring forward uh, recommendations to you. So the second piece we'll talk about is that 90-day temporary operating agreement. Just want to point out that the purpose of, uh, of tonight's presentation, as well as the pilot program uh, at large, is to provide information to help you support a sound policy decision. Uh, we're going to bring you a lot of data and observations at the end of this pilot uh, to hopefully help you make that sound policy decision. So with the pilot program, what this does is amend Chapter 14 of Peoria City Code. Uh, it permits and governs the pilot program. Uh, it allows us to explore this new transportation option. And most importantly, it expires 120 days from the effective date of the ordinance. So no further action is necessary at that time. Uh, I want to point out that these agreements make clear that we have no obligation to take uh, any particular action or, or any action whatsoever. The elements of the pilot program include uh, requiring a temporary operating agreement, which is that second document, and it allows only one temporary operating agreement. The agreement, the pilot program, can be terminated at any time, and if that uh, option is exercised, the fleet has to be removed within 72 hours. Uh, the pilot program caps the fleet at 200 units, and at each nesting location, uh, no more than three scooters can be deployed. And then lastly, it restricts deployment locations and governs the operation of the scooters. I want to talk first about the deployment locations. And I want to stress that there are only three types of locations where birds will be allowed to be nested. Right now, it's as you've seen, uh, you see them kind of all across the city in a variety of locations and in a variety of settings. The pilot program limits that to just three. And we're going to talk about what those are. Uh, we're going to start with the map here of our three arterial transit routes, 83rd Avenue running north and south, and then Thunderbird and Peoria running east and west. Along those transit routes, going to the next slide, is the first of the three places that will deploy scooters under this pilot program, and that is at transit stops along those three routes. So what you see up on the screen there uh, is a schematic of the typical uh, transit shelter uh, depicted by the brown roof there. Just to the right, you'll see a, a dashed line around what we call the arterial deployment area. That's where at a, a bus shelter, uh, scooters can be deployed, typically between the shelter and a trash can or near a, a bike rack, things of that nature. So that is the first of the three location types for deployment. The second of the third, of the three rather, uh, is within neighborhoods. And again, we have a schematic, and this is actually in, in the agreement as well. Uh, this depicts the intersection of two residential streets. You'll see the ADA ramp depicted there at, at the curve of the intersection. Uh, we're avoiding that, but just beyond that ramp on either side is a rectangle where scooters can be deployed. They would be deployed here parallel to the curb, uh, out of the traffic lane, not on the sidewalk, kind of what you would consider the curb area. With those, they have to remain, of course, outside of any uh, ADA uh, areas and, of course, in compliance with any other laws. And then the third and final location where scooters can be placed is on private property 
with the permission of the private property owner. Typically what, what we foresee is, is businesses uh, will be uh, in, in partnership with the vendor to, to allow scooters to be deployed at their locations. We do not regulate that in any way other than the fact that the cap of 200 includes any that are deployed at uh, private property locations. So moving from deployment to rider operation, uh, again, on, on the arterials, on these major roadways, uh, the scooters have to be ridden on the sidewalks. Uh, real quickly, that, that decision was based on a couple of factors. Uh, the, the size, width, speeds on our, our streets, uh, and the fact that our, our sidewalks, maybe compared to other jurisdictions, aren't highly traveled sidewalks compared to our streets. Uh, and We felt that that was a more appropriate place to put them. Uh, they are prohibited on the arterial streets from traveling in the traffic lanes, bike lanes, as well as on our city's paths or trails. Uh, riders must dismount when they're crossing the street, and when they're on the sidewalk, they must yield to pedestrians and other users. And users must be 18 years of age or older and must be licensed drivers. Some additional rider operation uh, rules. One rider at a time on a scooter. Riders must obey by all existing laws, such as those pertaining to driving uh, under the influence. Uh, there are no parking areas called out in the agreement. I won't cover all of those, but they're the typical things you might expect, such as red and yellow curbs, not blocking a fire hydrant, things of that nature. Uh, you can't park in front of another person's private property without their permission. If it is adjacent to a private property, it has to be upright and parallel to the curb. Uh, and then the last item there, rider operation, uh, the speed limit is 12 miles per hour or whatever is reasonable, reasonable and prudent given the current conditions. So that's kind of an overview of the pilot program. At this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Vanessa, our city attorney, and she will cover the temporary operating agreement. Thank you, Jay. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the council. Thank you. As Jay mentioned, I will cover the temporary operating agreement, the second part of the, uh, the package that we're discussing tonight. The temporary operating agreement allows bird rides to participate in the pilot program. So it establishes the deployment and use terms and conditions. It also provides the city with liability protection, obviously very important for uh, this to be covered in a very comprehensive fashion as part of the agreement. Additionally, it expires 90 days from the effective date of the ordinance. Another important aspect of the temporary operating agreement are the program fees. We have the fees set as the application fee of 2,500, a monthly enforcement fee of 250 per scooter, and then the relocation fee of $25. So if there is a scooter that's impounded, it would be a $25 fee to uh, recover the vehicle from, or the scooter from impound. Other requirements in the temporary operating agreement, the scooters are required to be maintained in good working order. If they're not, if they're inoperable or they're, they're malfunctioning, BIRD is required to pick them up within two hours. And if that doesn't occur, the city can then pick them up. Uh, there is a requirement for a 24-hour toll-free customer service number and an email to address safety concerns, complaints, or questions, also to notify them of any issues. The company is also required to provide notice to riders via a mobile or web application of all pilot program regulations, rider responsibilities, uh, in the operation and parking of stand-up electric scooters, and the necessity for the riders to obey all traffic and safety laws. Also as part of the temporary operating agreement, the uh, operator is required to put together a comprehensive city approved communication and education plan. It will summarize the action that's to be taken by the operator during the pilot program to educate riders on the pilot program uh, rules and regulations. One of the also very important aspects, and one of the reasons that we're moving forward with uh, discussing this this evening, are the data sharing requirements that are built into the temporary operating agreement. 
So the company is required to provide the city with data. We discussed the data uh, very thoroughly as part of the study session, but as a reminder, uh, the data can consist of the ID numbers for all the stand-up electric scooters that are participating in the pilot program, as well as weekly reports on scooter use data, which can include the total number of rides per day or per month and miles driven, total number of scooters in service for the previous month, scooter crash and damage reports, customer service complaints, and the GPS date and time and duration information about the rides. So we can try and, and narrow down the data and better understand uh, how these scooters are operating during the pilot program period. Uh, the expectations for the data is that the data will be um, accurate and that the company will deliver, which will be a key measure to the city's ability to, um, again, to measure the company's commitment to working with the city collaboratively. The need to obtain this data in a timely manner and to obtain accurate data is very important to the city and the ability to measure the outcomes from the pilot program. Um, to, to further emphasize the importance of accurate data, we are requiring the company to provide the city with an affidavit that attests to the accuracy, validity, and completeness of the data as part of the temporary operating agreement. The temporary operating agreement also covers the deployment requirements, so you'll find the uh, locations as per the ordinance are also in the temporary operating agreement. There is a requirement that the uh, stand-up electric scooters are picked up by 9 p.m. and deployed no earlier than 6 a.m. So they are picked up every 24 hours and then deployed at, at 6 o'clock the next morning. As I mentioned previously, there is a two-hour period upon notice for the, uh, the company to pick up uh, scooters that need to be removed for any reason, relocated, or they're inoperable, uh, you know, incorrectly deployed, or unsafe. If that doesn't happen, the city can then pick up the scooters and impound them from there. If there is a public safety concern, the city can pick them up immediately and does not have to wait for the two hour period. Uh, the scooters may remain in impound for two business days. If they're not picked up within two business days, then they do become the property of the city. As I mentioned at the outset, one of the uh, two of the important elements of the operating agreement, so insurance and indemnification. We, we do have both provisions in the agreement. Uh, we have a requirement that the company defends and indemnifies the city. Another requirement that, that the riders release and indemnify the city as well. Uh, also that the company maintain general liability and workers' compensation insurance coverage and names the city as an additional insured on their insurance policies so that we're, uh, we make sure we have the appropriate insurance coverage. And with that, I will turn it back over to Jay. Thank you, Vanessa. <clears throat> uh, at this point, uh, we would ask if you have any questions. Right, council. Question, all right, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanna make, uh, I have one quick question and then a, a request on this, by the way. Um, so I saw that it said pick up all of the, um, the birds by by, I believe, 9 p.m. redeploy by 6. So a quick clarification, does that mean every single bird that is on the street, so there will be zero birds anywhere on the street between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., or does it simply mean the ones that are out of a nesting position would be picked up and then redeployed by 6 a.m.? Uh, Vice Mayor Finn, the intent is for every bird to be uh, collected. <clears throat> uh, part of that is, is to make sure that they're constantly reviewing the locations, that they're not getting stagnant, and that they're, you know, remaining serviceable. Um, thank you. And then the, um, the second, you had mentioned, this probably isn't the time, but you would mentioned something about the, um, the data at the end, having a lot of data at the end to analyze. I would like to request if this does go through, that we would, the council would be provided monthly updates on those data so that we can kind of see the trends as they're going, if that's, if that's possible. I don't want to wait until 
the very end if this goes through to try and analyze the data real quick on, on how it, so I'd like monthly if, if at all possible. Absolutely, we'll, we'll be reviewing it pretty frequently and we'll provide regular updates. Okay. All my questions, I have comments for later, but those are my questions for right now. Okay, Council Member Patetta. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Jay, my question is, I'm still curious about enforcement. Uh, what kind of problem is this going to create for our police officers? And for example, if they find a 14-year-old riding, are they going to ticket this person? And what will the fines be uh, if this person goes to court? Have we determined that yet? Council Member Patena, uh, in terms of enforcement, uh, we're not sure that this is going to create a uh, tremendous burden. Uh, as it is, we've got uh, young persons riding bicycles and scooters all over the city, those that belong to them. So as, as the police deal with those, they would deal with these similarly. Uh, the, the fines would fall under the similar fines for, for improper use of bicycles. I don't know what that dollar amount is, but the city has fines in place uh, for what those are. Councilmember Binsbacher? No. Okay. Councilmember Hunt. <clears throat> okay, first of all, I had a resident call today, and he asked, well, he said his 13-year-old son has a debit card that he's supposed to use in certain ways, but certainly it's the boys to use. Um, if he uses it to uh, rent a bird, he's 13, but say anybody under 18, I'll just make it more general, actually uses the bird and has a wreck or bumps over, gets hurt, breaks his elbow or something. Does bird uh, cover that since the person using it was using it illegally? Mayor and uh, Council Member Hunt are, yes, we would argue that, again, Bird is required to indemnify the city for uh, any claim that is brought up uh, that pursuant to the temporary <coughs> operating agreement. Also, there would be a defense because the rider was not following the law, uh, but we would uh, bring Bird in and, and Bird would indemnify the city and, and defend the city on any, any sort of lawsuit that would arise. Okay, so the answer is yes. Whatever silly decision somebody makes, rides really illegally, they're still covered. So the answer is that yes, the uh, we would we would approach Bird and ask them to comply with the contract where they have to indemnify us and and defend any claim. Again, it doesn't stop somebody from suing even if they're doing something incorrectly, but. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bird would have a, a very strong defense if somebody is doing something they shouldn't be doing. Okay, thank you. Um, is this just a time for questions or comments as well? You make comments. Comments, okay. Um, well, first of all, I am 100% in favor of this trial period. And I, I don't know how I'll vote at the end because that's what a trial period is for. But I think it would be disingenuous on our part to say that we're working on a transportation plan for our city and just to say, however, we're going to stick our head in the sand on this particular because, in my case, I'm too old, old to ever use it. I would never use it. Nobody in my demographic is ever going to use it. We, we, I just feel we can't do that. We have to look forward. We have to look to our we have to make transportation desirable for our millennials, and they are using these, whether it's Bird or another motorized scooter, they are using them. If you don't believe it, go to Tempe. Now, they're not allowed on the campus, but they are thick. They're like a flock of birds uh, on the streets and everywhere else in the city, and it's the college students that are using them. It's that demographic. Um, and, and they're going to get older, and they're already going to be used to using more modern means of transportation. So I just feel like we have to examine this with our eyes wide open and say, uh, this is something that we have to look at as part of our potential transportation plan. They're coming. They're, they're coming, whether City of Peoria decides to embrace them or we want something different, whatever this means of transportation is 
let's see, I heard Lori say they were doing the transportation plan as we move, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, the what? Circulation plan? Land the circulation plan? plan as we move forward, not as we sit still or as we move backwards. I heard somebody say looking to the future. I heard someone else say livability goals. Uh, this fits all of those. I do believe that it deserves a trial period. Uh, for those of you who were alive at the time, Model A's were not particularly popular when they were introduced as an automobile in the muddy streets of New York City and Boston. And yet, look where we are today. So uh, I would say the analogy is uh, pretty accurate there. All of us tend to be, eh, I wouldn't use it, you know, a little bit afraid, they're dangerous, they're, they're gonna congest our, whatever. We, we tend to, and we tend to express negative reactions rather than positive reactions as individuals, we do that. It's just our nature. Um, they are affordable, they reduce emissions, they're clean, they're convenient, and they're fun. We had some uh, emails that just said, it's fun. Their family goes, uses them like a bike ride through the neighborhood. They, four of them use these. Um, I will say to Bird, we would expect you to be exceptionally responsible. The onus is on you to prove that you belong in our city. We're not gonna take this lightly and say, bring it on, we don't care. We do care a lot. Uh, about the hazards or any, the clutter, anything that could go wrong. We care a lot. Also, I really, as an educator, I really want to emphasize the education piece on this to all different um, possible users, age groups, demographics. You have to have education anytime you're going to bring in a new idea, a new, a new anything. Um, just any, I can't think of anything that isn't enhanced and actually required to have education in order to make it work because most of us wouldn't know how to operate a scooter. We did as kids, but that was the kind that you used your foot for and uh, we, we just wouldn't know how to do that. I also really want to encourage, uh, and this is again for the bird, the bird people, um, to go to those private places where you can place your, uh, your vehicles in the entertainment district. I see that as a real user hotbed for this type of transportation. I do have a little bit of a uh, kerfuffle on that in that in the, trans in the entertainment district, I'm not sure nine o'clock would be late enough to allow them out because there are bars and restaurants in there that stay open, but that's something probably to be worked out a different time. So I will just reiterate, I just don't see how we can be responsible moving forward in our city without giving these a trial period, and that is what I will be voting for. Thank you. Council Member Leone? My question is, how many days did we give him right now? Councilman Leone, can you clarify how many days do we give them for what? To ride the scooters. They've been out there for, I believe, 62 days. 62 days? Yes, sir. They've been riding them for 62 days. Now you want to give them another 90 days? Don't you know after 62 days? Well, you want it or not? Council Member Leone, what we're proposing is the 90-day pilot with specific uh, restrictions that allow us to measure, among other things, the first and last mile concept uh, to regulate the deployment locations to provide, I guess, a different perspective on what some regulation around their use might, might provide. You realize, and I, Back in 1945, before you was born, my nephew sitting out there, we used to make scooters. 
And I was wondering why we didn't patent it. But we used to make scooters. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't know what they could do. Now, my, my other question is that you ride them on a sidewalk, right? The bikes are on the sidewalk. People with baby carriage is on the sidewalks. Joggers are on the sidewalks. So now you add one more to this uh, a problem that's going to happen. It may not happen this month. It may not happen in six months. But it's going to happen, and we're going to be sued. I don't care what she wrote up. You're going to get a lawyer that's going to come in there and tear us apart. So my, my, my thing is that I would like to see this dropped altogether, and hopefully uh, we come up with something better than scooters. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Fan. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a couple of comments that I wanted to make, and um, I think Councilman, Councilmember Leone made a, a point about the 62 days that it's been operating, and I understand that frustration because I have that, still have that same frustration that for 62 days it was basically um, whatever Bird wanted to do. And um, I believe a viewer in the study session described me as very passionate about uh, my opinion on this. And the, um, in the last meeting, but I've had some time to kind of have some introspection about my feelings about it. And I just wanted to share that um, not only with, with staff, fellow council members, um, public and, and pe people viewing, I just wanted to kind of get this off my chest a little bit and kind of um, say what I have to say. And I will, I will do my best to be, um, to be brief, but I've, I've come through some introspec introspection to kind of buy in a little bit to the first mile last mile concept for some of our citizens, that um, citizens that take the bus that need a, a, you know, it would really help them when they get off of the bus to jump on a scooter and get to their doctor's appointment, whatever that may be, get to work, um, whatever that may be, I can somewhat buy into that, that thought process, which is why I, I thank um, staff for coming up with an agreement that um, would limit them to basically the bus stops on the arterial roads. To Mr. Leone's point, the way that it's been going now, um, I would have to vote absolutely no, with no regulation or anything that was going along with it. I just couldn't imagine that that um, functioning. Councilman Edwards mentioned a cap, which we've addressed in here, and we've put a cap of 200 on this, which is okay. That's that's fine. We've got a cap in there, so it doesn't turn into some of the pictures that Councilman Ed Edwards showed from. I think it was Long Beach. Is that the beach you were hanging out on, John? Yes. Long Beach. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I just want to thank you for addressing those in, in, um, in that agreement. But um, I believe in, in database decision making. And um, I think the only way that we're going to get that is to put parameters around it like we have now. And one of the biggest moments for me was to recognize the fact that I, this is not my, I am not in this seat right now to voice my own personal opinion. I am in this seat to voice the opinion of the 20,000 people that are in the Palo Verde district. And right now, I don't have that opinion. When we had that study session, I think, I don't want to misquote the number, but I think we only got 12 comments in, in the public outreach. 12 people doesn't represent, <laughs> you know, a majority of, of the citizens in, in uh, my district or anyone else's district. So I, I am inclined to support the pilot program to gather that data and truly let the citizens have input on if this is what they want in the city and if it's beneficial. The data will tell me if millennials are using them, if, if this is important to them. We all have our own opinion, but I don't, believe in, I don't believe in that. I believe in reading data and actual numbers, and that's what I want to be able to see um, um, from, from this study. So I said I was going to be brief. I think I lied. Um, but the last thing that I want to say is Anyone that is out there watching right now, anyone that views us later, we want to hear from you and we want your opinion as we go through this trial program. I want to hear from anyone out there that has an opinion, whether it's good or bad, I want to hear it all. I, I encourage you to contact your council member um, and let them know what your opinions are and what your feelings are. So I think I've checked everything off of my list and I apologize for going long. Council member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, to, to Vice Mayor Finns, um, you know, 
I, I have gone to several cities that, that have these currently um, in their areas, Long Beach, Santa Monica, and the, the amount of them and the care that's taken, um, they're just, they're everywhere. There's no rhyme or reason to, there's no docking stations. There's, they're just laid, littered across the areas. And I know that we're trying to do an ordinance that with the bird uh, to, to mitigate those issues, but I'm still not sold. Um, you know, I, I think we do have an opportunity to, with the emerging transportation and technology, to create an ordinance that provides um, transport for all entities. And I'm not sure that this current ordinance, this just this ordinance is just addressing the bird. It's not addressing any other alternative, like you mentioned the Lyme. And I know they haven't come to the city, but this would mitigate them from coming to the city because this ordinance is specifically for one vendor. If that's if that, if I'm not mistaken. And so I, right now, I've talked to residents, I've gone to the P83, some of the P83 businesses and spoken to them, and they talk about the fact that they're, they're, right now they're blocking the entrances to their establishments and that those businesses are on the bus route. And I know that the company says they're gonna clean some of those up, I'm just not 100% sold, so uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, would you care to address the, uh, the issue of this ordinance being strictly for one vendor? Yes, uh, Mayor and, and uh, Council Member Edwards, we can do that. Uh, this is a pilot, and, and while you're correct that this pilot does limit it to just the one vendor uh, moving forward, we would not be so, so limited necessarily. Uh, why we chose to do that uh, is kind of what we, we discussed earlier, that f to, to truly study this, we wanted to have a controlled environment. We wanted to have a, a, a usable, manageable number of these. Uh, we wanted to have uh, a relationship with a vendor that uh, we could build these parameters around so that we could have a, a good data set to come back to you with. And we felt the best way to do that was to work with, with one vendor. Thank you. <laughs> Vice Mayor. It's, it's a short one, I promise. I just want to clarify that the, if, if this does pass at the end of this, it is the sole decision of this council on whether or not we feel that, um, that it should continue. Or, or if there's other modifications that need to be done, that would be the council making modifications and recommendations to change anything moving forward. So for example, to Councilman Edwards' point, this wouldn't be something that, hey, if we pass it, it still limits it to, to just the bird or anything. We have the opportunity to make adjustments to this program at the end of, of this trial period. We can look at it and say, look, this worked, this didn't work. Um, that's all, that all sits with us. Is that correct? Vice Mayor Finn, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I concur with much if not all of what Vice Mayor has said. You should, you should go with all. Yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, you know, wish that these hadn't been rolled out or, or introduced to our city exactly like they were. But I do feel like we have reeled it in and taken control of the situation um, to be able to move forward with a pilot. I have uh, received input from citizens that... Uh, you know, some are for it, some are not. Um, more are for it than are not, based on the correspondence that I have received. Uh, but as Vice Mayor had said, I feel like the data is really gonna tell the story, and I support a pilot, which is just that. It's gonna give us the information we need to make a, de a decision that represents our constituents. And that's um, so why I support this pilot, because it gives them an opportunity to tell us and show us, um, you know, that they want it or they don't want it. That's what will ultimately determine how I vote for this in the end, because it's about representing all of them. And that's what I believe we're trying to do in this pilot program, and that's why I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a large number of emails that were that were sent to us from a variety of citizens who have used uh, these bird scooters in the past, and the, they have laid out somewhat how they use them, and I thought that it was quite interesting to see um, some of them are using them as a family, you know, like you might go out for a bike ride, they're going out for a scooter ride. Uh, here's a guy who, you know, takes his car in for service, and instead of having to wait there for two hours, he takes a scooter and goes home and then comes back. So, you know, I, I, I think that... <laughs> 
We just need to be open for a minute and see what is on the horizon. What do our citizens want? What new things can we offer them as a city? It would be, um, I think, beyond our scope to say we can never change. We can never move forward. We can never accept something new. What we're doing tonight is simply putting a program in place that creates an orderly system for these um, for these scooters. It, it limits their ability to deter others, pedestrians, uh, ADA uh, users, any of those things. We're putting some um, regulations in place that should have been there from the beginning. I, I don't appreciate that they were dropped in our city without these kinds of things. It, it is causing us now to have to get over that and move beyond it. But nevertheless, you know, the past is the past and we need to move forward, as Councilmember Hunt said. So I completely support that we are putting a program in place that gives us the ability to get the data to find out what our citizens want. This is really just about what our citizens want. It's temporary, it's a temporary ordinance, um, and it's a temporary program for 90 days. So that is that. I think we have had our say. So now it is time for us to vote, and we are gonna vote on these items separately. Item 16R is a temporary ordinance establishing a 120-day pilot program for stand-up electric scooter sharing system. Do I have a motion on item 16R? So moved. Two motions. How about a motion and a second? Thank you, council, please vote. So please vote. Did you vote? Okay, so this is a simple majority. Uh, and that means that this ordinance passes without the emergency um, effective date. So that means it will go into effect 30 days from now. Correct? All right, that passes. Second item is 17R, Contract Temporary Operating Agreement with Bird Rides, Inc. for participation in the 120-day pilot program for stand-up electric scooter sharing. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. And that passes again with a Simple majority, five to two. Yes. Sorry, I think this is a record for me on questions in one evening. Um, so if I understand what just happened here, that if this doesn't go into place for 30 days, correct? Right. I'm still somewhat dealing um, on paper with the same Wild West I've been dealing with for the past 30 to 60 days, is that correct? It Technically, uh, Vice Mayor, that is correct. I okay. will tell you that uh, Bird has been moving gradually and steadily towards making the environment look like what's in the okay. agreement. And I think we would all ask that they move even more swiftly in that direction, uh, knowing that that's the direction we're going to go. I would ask Bird to begin moving in that direction immediately. So that would be my request to the, uh, the company, that uh, they respect what, what we just did and they move in that direction effective immediately. That would be my request. Thank you. And they are in the audience, and I know that they are listening, and we do respect your, um, ah, we respect your ability to do so or not to do so, since we did not vote that in, but we hope that you will show in good faith um, that you respect the ordinance that is upcoming. May I say something else? Yes. I would hope that also in this 30-day period that there would be a lot of education taking place. As I understand it, this is a, a time, I, I feel it's time for Bird to show good faith and move towards the requirements that will be in place in 30 days. And again, I just feel so strongly about the educational component because the more we educate people, the more they're going to be smart about using them when we actually start the time clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we will now move on to reports from the city manager, Mr. Tyne. 
Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. And um, just a few items to go through. And first off, I wanted to ask our Public Works Director, Kevin Burke, to come back up as we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge one of our outstanding employees who you did see just a little earlier on. Um, and with that, I'll let Mr. Burke provide a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Time, Mayor, members of Council. So it's my privilege tonight to uh, recognize, pardon me, fighting those allergies. Uh, <laughs> recognize Becky Borquez, our uh, environmental coordinator, who's a valuable member of our solid waste team for an outstanding accomplishment in it recently. So the Arizona Recycling Coalition is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting waste reuse, reduction, and recycling throughout Arizona and our Southwest region. Uh, each year they award individuals that demonstrate high levels of dedication and professional leadership and successful implementation and implementation in waste reduction. This year, the envirom our environmental coordinator, Rebecca Becky Borquez, received the 2018 Recycling Educator of the Year Award. Uh, this is a, Rebecca received the award for her outstanding track record of education in both the public and private sectors. Rebecca has become a trusted advisor on how to educate and implement cost-effective and revenue-generating solutions. Her educational programs and curriculum have effectively taught the motto of reduce, reuse, and recycle to audiences ranging from elementary school age children and their parents to business owners and politicians in the city of Peoria. She has done this for close to two decades now. Rebecca continues to make a big impact through her teaching and education on best practices for the recycling industry and sustainability. So for that, we wanted to recognize Rebecca. Congratulations. Great, thank you. And uh, two other items, both uh, being videos. The first, uh, a new video on the new council boundaries that will be changing effective January 1st, 2019. These changes are a result of the 2017 redistricting process and will go in effect with the swearing in of new council members uh, shortly. We wanted to just show a quick 30 second video that will air on our cable station to inform our citizens on these new boundaries. The city of Peoria has completed its redistricting process. The mid-decade census counted over 161,000 residents in Peoria. There was almost a 5% population increase since 2010's census population count. To comply with the Voting Rights Act, Peoria's six districts will have approximately 26,000 people. This will go into effect January 2019, and the new boundaries will look like this. Some Peoria residents council members will change as a result of the redistricting. To find out who your council members are and an interactive map to see the new district boundaries, please visit PeoriaAZ.gov forward slash redistricting. Great. And lastly, we do have a video presenting the upcoming Polar Plunge event in January 2019 at the Sunrise Mountain High School pool. be seen on a bicycle I know that certain council members like uh, have been seen in the pool at that polar plunge so uh, with that that is all I have thank you Mayor. thank you mr. Tyne okay I am gonna um, I move to uh, speaker request forms I have two speaker request forms for uh, non agenda items and the first one is Jeff and Michelle Peterson do you please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record? You have three minutes to speak. Mayor and council members, uh, it's Jeff and Michelle Peterson. We're at 27237 North Whitehorn Trail in Peoria. We're part of West Wing Mountain Development. We're here tonight because of an ongoing problem that we have, and it seems to have fallen on pretty deaf ears with regards to the code compliance area. Uh, it's concerning supplemental regulations 800 under walls and fences 21805 we have a party wall 
that is broken. It's shared with our neighbor behind us. It's a 70 foot by 78 inches tall wall. Uh, upon our investigation of this uh, matter, we have determined that the neighbor's grading, uh, dirt level, and subsequent waterfall are anywhere from 16 to 30 inches above grading uh, requirements, which are at the footer, shared footer. Uh, we determine this from the development grading plan that we received from Gary Lopez in city engineering. It's supposed to be under section GG and they're supposed to match at the footer level. Um, part of the supplemental regulations under number three is maintenance. If it becomes under disrepair uh, or damaged unsightly, in this case, it's broken. I mean, there's a section where it's, the neighbor's grading is 30 inches above. That's the section that's actually broken and fallen into our backyard. Uh, code compliance, Jack Stroud has not followed through with any, uh, let's just say that code compliance, I mean, if you have a broken wall falling in your backyard, you'd think code compliance would follow up. We've talked, well, at least would assist something be done as opposed to having our wall fall into our backyard. Now it's further breaking down towards the other side. Um, it's exacerbated on the one side because they have a waterfall that is also has stagnant water, it's green. We have more mosquitoes in our backyard now. It could be from that, I can't, I can't tell you, but it has not been addressed by them and won't be addressed. It hasn't, like I said, it seems to be falling on deaf ears with them. Um, also through um, uh, our investigation and talking with Gary Lopez, we have determined also that they have no uh, permits. They have a retaining wall that also holds up this dirt that's up against a wall. The retaining wall is a little bit further down. There's no permits for that retaining wall. So, and again, code compliance is not following up with that. They haven't, they haven't addressed our concerns. Uh, we've also talked to zoning and planning. Um, I do believe her name was, <laughs> I didn't get a full name, her name was Lou. And that's, she also said, well, code compliance is supposed to follow up with regards to the zoning and planning portion. And I said, I wish I could get them to do that, but I have not, we have not been able to do it. They followed up with us. So we're just asking for hopefully some assistance with this in remedying this situation because we have a broken wall that's falling into our backyard and it just keeps getting worse. Thank you for your comments. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to to reply to you in on non-agenda items, but I will ask um, our city manager if he could have a staff member speak to you. Great. Thank, Thank you. Exactly. you. Appreciate will, your time. We will talk. Uh, if you may stay after the meeting, we can absolutely make sure we discuss Thank it. Thank you. Right. And the next speaker request form is Mr. James Dibler. Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, in Phoenix Council District 5. This is a good idea for the city of Peoria for putting a neighborhood six-letter bus route in the north part of the city. This new Six-letter bus route will travel from Arrowhead Town Center to 67th Avenue and Half Divide Road. It will pick up and drop off passengers at Sunrise Mountain High School and other places around the city. I wish that new six-letter bus route will pick up and drop off passengers at Glendale Community College, no campus. The city of Phoenix and Glendale are concerned extending 67th Avenue bus route, route from Newton Hills Drive to Glendale Community College, no campus, at 59th Avenue and Happy Valley Road 
and Northwest Phoenix to meaning that connection with North Peoria neighborhood singular bus route. The city of Phoenix used to have a neighborhood singular route in the Deal Valley area to go from Glendale Community College North Campus to the shopping center at Interstate 17 Freeway and Happy Valley Road. This neighborhood circulator was limited due to low watership. Ship. This expansion will help no Peoria residents to get to school, work, and around the valley. Thank you for no time and consideration. Thank you for your comments. All right, we will now move on to reports from the City Council, and we will begin with Youth Council Liaison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to start by congratulating uh, the Young Artist Program winners, uh, and I'd also like to uh, congratulate the newly appointed Board and com Commissions members uh, and welcome the new members of the Youth Advisory Board. Uh, last Youth Advisory Board meeting, uh, we talked about the plastic bag challenge, uh, special events, and uh, our subcommittees. Uh, I'm also excited about uh, the City Council's decision uh, to go forward with the bird uh, trial. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Mayor. On uh, November 15th, I attended the Westbrook Village uh, Veterans Appreciation Dinner. I believe this is their fifth year. It's a sellout every year, and uh, this event recognizes all veterans from World War II all the way to Desert Storm and, and beyond. Uh, we, they recognize each uh, veteran that attends uh, on a screen, and they give them uh, a gift as well. Uh, again, this is the fifth year, and it's, it's, uh, I always look forward uh, to this event. On uh, November 30th, I met with uh, Merchant Marine uh, veteran Norman Palmer. There's been just some discussion that the uh, Merchant Marine should be recognized at, the, uh, at our memorial at Rio Vista Park. Right now, we recognize the five services, and uh, um, there's nothing there for the uh, uh, Merchant Marines. And so Mr. Palmer gave me a, a real education on what the, what the Merchant Marines did, particularly uh, during World War II. And so uh, the mayor and I and, and the rest of the council are going to, and the uh, not, uh, veteran subcommittee are going to determine whether or not we will recognize uh, the Merchant Marines at the uh, uh, Rio Vista Memorial. Uh, this p weekend, I attended the uh, Christmas event. Um, again, this is a free event that is sponsored by the city. Uh, the way they set it up this year, there was a uh, I've been going to this event for many years, and this is probably the most people I've ever seen at the event. And as I was walking around, I, I looked around. There's, there's generators and miles and miles of wire. Police and fire coverage is necessary. Uh, bouncy houses, food trucks, entertainment rides for kids, snow, Santa coming on a fire truck, just to mention a few of the things. And the event was really uh, flawless again, and I want to th uh, thank... Uh, Chris Hallett and his staff uh, for pulling off another wonderful event. Thank you, Chris, for that. Um, special thank you to AFSME uh, for all your hard work on a day of giving. Um, you're helping those who are less fortunate and making their day and year a, a little brighter. I, I know some of the organizations that you participated with, Heart Pantry, uh, to help a young girl get a heart transplant, that was just extraordinary. So uh, if, if uh, those of you who are so inclined, I hope that you will be able to donate to this. It's a wonderful uh, thing that they're doing. And uh, thanks to Ask Me and all of your membership. Um, I want everyone to know that once again, I will not be participating in the solar plunge. Uh, <laughs> it's never gonna happen. And sadly, uh, my wife and I would like to uh, extend our condolences to Councilmember Leone on the loss of his uh, wife, Joan. Uh, Joan was a very sweet and desirable, uh, likable woman, and she will be, uh, she will be greatly missed. Uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to the entire Leone family. That's all I have, Mayor. Councilmember Vince Bucker. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to also congratulate AFSCME. Fantastic presentation. The work that you're doing out in the community, it just it makes our city better, better and it's building strong communities, adding to our quality of life. So thank you for all of the wonderful work that you and your membership continue to do. Also want to thank all of our volunteers um, on boards and commissions. I truly appreciate all of you sharing your time and talent with our city. We can't do what we do without volunteers. So thank you. Um, and welcome to all of those that are, are new. Uh, and to the youth artists uh, from this evening as well. Uh, always so nice to see the young artists express themselves the way they do and then tell what inspired them to uh, create such unbelievable art. Um, I think that's all I, oh, congratulations to, to Becky Borges in, in Public Works too. I, fantastic job on the public outreach. I had the opportunity to uh, see how well received the um, Don't Treat Me Like Trash uh, program was at one of our Peoria schools. Um, it was actually Basis Peoria. And um, I'm just really proud of that program. I just think it's wonderful the effort that you're doing to educate folks very important messaging. So happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Finn. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to start with my, uh, my heartfelt condolences to Carlo and his family as well. Um, my thoughts and prayers over the holiday seasons are, are with you all. Um, ask me what an absolutely amazing video. It's, it's, it's stunning to see all of the things that you do for the community out, out there. So um, thank you so much for everything that you do. It's, it was very, very impressive. Um, and just so that you guys know, I got here about 30 minutes early, and there was tons more that they had to share, and I think they condensed it down a little bit. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that maybe we didn't even see. Um, so it was incredibly impressive. Congratulations, Becky. Very well done. Um, I also wanted to mention the, the uh, tree lighting event because I was I was somewhat blown away. I, I had a I had an actual reserve parking spot somewhere that, honest to goodness, I couldn't get to. There were so many people at this event, I finally had to um, park behind Wilhelm Automotive. I'm pretty sure I was illegally parked, so thanks for not telling me, Chief. Um, but it was the only place that I could find to park, and I was there probably 90 minutes early to this thing. It was absolutely incredible. It was so well done. So many people there. It was absolutely phenomenal. I was so impressed. Staff, you did an absolute amazing job, as usual. That's not a surprise. Um, also not a surprise, I will not be doing the solar plunge either. So if you want to meet for breakfast, Bill, I'd be happy to meet you somewhere for, for breakfast. That would be great. A warm, warm breakfast, warm, hot breakfast. That would be fantastic. Um, and then finally, I want to um, throw a shout out and congratulations to the Centennial Coyotes. Um, they happened to squeak by in the, um, the state championship football game on Saturday. It was a nail biter right up until kickoff, and it finished. <laughs> It finished 60 to 7 in uh, Centennial's favor. So um, congratulations to them. I'm sure we'll be honoring them um, later on. And I also wanted to mention that some of the, of all of the volunteer things that the city does, there are also students at the high schools that are trying to help some needy families. So I'm not going to kind of throw that, that pitch out right now, but if you, well, I am going to throw the pitch out. If you want to try and help out with that and some of these needy families, I think it's really uh, important to to kind of get those kids at that age helping families and volunteering. So if you'd like contact information on that, uh, anyone that's watching at home, please contact my office and I will make sure that I get contact information in your area for some of the families that those high school kids are trying to help over the holidays. So I think it's a really neat thing that they are doing. And that is all I have. And that was a lot. Are you sure? Yeah, done. I checked them all off. All right, so um, Council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, my wife and I also want to uh, express our condolences to the Leone family um, in this time. And um, Joan was a, a great lady, and she's going to be sorely missed. Um, on the 15th, I attended the Westbrook Village uh, Veterans Dinner uh, with Bill, and the, the, the event just keeps getting bigger every year. Um, and just the amount of uh, reservations seem to go 
come in right after the it ends. Reservations for people wanting to get into the next one seem to show up almost immediately. So it just shows that the popularity of that of that program, and I, I fully support it and thank everybody that uh, that sat at our table. So um, that was a great event. On the 29th of this month, I had um, lunch with a councilman over at Liberty High School. Now, Frank, I want to thank you for coming out and attending. And, and we had about 30, 13 students that came out and we talked about just various topics that were on their minds, whether it was um, um, code or, um, sign ordinances. We talked about elections. Actually, we talked about the uh, elections with the uh, recent school board. Um, not passing, and we talked about how that how they thought that was going to affect them. So it was some very good dialogue. We had members of the um, of the uh, PUSD that were there, and so we're listening to their their concerns. So it was very good dialogue, and I appreciate everybody that came out and, and attended that. I too attended the Old Town uh, Festival, and um, Mike, you didn't do as good a job as the mayor would have done in, 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 in lighting that tree. I get it. Sorry. Yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> uh, but to everybody's point, it was just a phenomenal event. It just seemed like everywhere you turned, there was just lots of activities going on. It was just a great event for everybody that was there. Uh, this past weekend on Saturday, I was able to attend a ribbon cutting over at uh, Kauai Sushi and Asian Cuisine over off of 83rd and Deer Valley. So it's a new establishment uh, here in, in Peoria and just walking them and if you have an opportunity to live up in the area um, phenomenal uh, location and great food so it's well worth the, the time and, and effort and then um, about a month ago I had an opportunity it was at a park fest and, and a young gentleman um, we had our street sweepers and our trash uh, trucks that were out at the facility and this young gentleman kept circling the the trucks and wanted to get in closer but just was kind of standoffish and <laughs> I later learned that um, he had a form of autism, and so he wasn't very good with, with individuals or groups. And so um, I reached out to staff, and Kevin, I just want to thank uh, you and your staff for a phenomenal job. You guys reached out to this uh, young gentleman's family and offered to do a private tour of our MOC facility. And so he was recently able to go out and sit in a street sweeper and a trash truck, and, I, and he actually... Um, Charlie, who is the operator, actually took um, Timothy out in the street sweeper and went out onto a public street and got, and so he got to experience um, his, uh, his, one of his dreams. He, his parents said that he has always been fascinated with Charlie is his hero and he has been following Charlie uh, since he was three years old. He's now th uh, almost 15. So they have a special bond. And so I just want to thank staff. This is, this is what Peoria staff does, everybody, um, is they go above and beyond for the residents of our city. Um, and so I just want to thank staff for an amazing job uh, with this individual. So thank you so much. And then lastly, I, I too want to just wish everybody a happy and safe holiday, not only for here on the dais, but for all those watching us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember um, Hunt, <laughs> that was thank the direction you, I was going. Well, I'm just going to heap it on you guys back there in the corner. But again, Ask Me does so much. And Mike's correct in that your video wasn't able to show even half of what you do. And I'm just so happy that you have started sharing what you do with all of us. You were sort of a silent partner there for a very long time. Personally, I really appreciate you coming to my park fests because just what John talked about, kids are enamored with trucks and um, they want to get up close to them. And this is uh, obviously they can't go on uh, and on trash collection day and be close to the big trucks, but they can at a park fest. And your guys are so gracious and it's such an educational opportunity. So uh, just thank you for everything that you do. Um, there were estimated to be about 12,000 people at the holiday festival. Um, it's an estimation because we don't charge, so obviously there's no gate to count people. But And they move around, you know, they go all over, so they're really hard to count. It's like counting ants. But um, our people do have a way of estimating that fairly accurately, and it just gets bigger every year. And you guys, you know why? Because it gets better every year. And Jen, your department advertises it bigger and better every year. Word of mouth just spreads, and... You guys never cease to, uh, or I should say, you never, well, you never cease to amaze me. You never disappoint. Uh, some things that I had specifically asked for last year, like 
lighting around the tree that's in the roundabout in front of Theater Works. It was all lit up this year. It was wonderful. And speaking of Theater Works, uh, they uh, invested in a big Christmas tree with all the lights and festivals right in front of Theater Works. And uh, the city of Peoria, through our arts department, has established quite, uh, well, really probably more through our community services, has established a real slate of events in Old Town. I, I can't remember what they are. You have to go online and actually check because we have food truck Fridays. We have music in the park or the plaza, which um, showcases local talent that are really, really good. You sit around on the grass or you bring your own chair. It's very informal, but it's just, it's very enriching and it just makes you feel like you're in a small town um, right right here in the <clears throat> midst of our very large town. Uh, speaking of Old Town, as I do frequently, um, we're welcoming a new kid on the block. Iron Key Studios has taken a lease on the corner property at 83rd Avenue and Washington Street. It's known as the Hood Building. It's one of the oldest buildings in Peoria and it is undergoing an adaptive reuse, which means instead of tearing it down, the person coming in, the, the group coming in, are going to reuse it by cleaning it up, new lighting, whatever it takes to make it really habitable. And they already have, it's a, it, Iron Key Studios is an arts facility, and they already have within one weekend they painted the lobby and hung an art exhibit. So it was open the other night. They had over 400 people come through the door there on that corner just to look at the art gallery exhibits. They're not open yet on a daily basis because they're still working and fixing up and the owners have day jobs. But uh, pretty soon they will be. They're in there working on Saturdays and Sundays and they are delighted to have people stop by. Um, I really want to give kudos to our women's club. I have been a member for 17 years, and I, we were, had a meeting today, and one thing that they really keep up on is uh, recycling. And last year they recycled over 5,000 plastic bags. Uh, we keep them at home, we uh, bring them in each time, or they recycle and report on the number. And uh, I gave a brief report today on the fact that you are, with Christmas coming up, you have to put your Christmas wrapping paper, your gift wrap, in the trash. Seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it's got chemicals and all that stuff in it that does not allow it to be recyclable. So I know it's, okay, it's paper, it goes in, recycle. No, it doesn't. So I reported on that today, and also to make sure that your recyclables are not recycled in plastic bags because that tears up the equipment. So that's just a couple things. Congratulations to little Raven Squires. She's a student at one of my schools, Peoria Elementary, and she won the arts, the mayor's art uh, contest that we had prior. Those of you that were here saw the kids get their awards. And she did a black and white of a hand that represented her home and it was all symbolic with, uh, I talked to her about it, it was just amazing. And it just proves that art is not all just what comes out on paper. It's the thought process and it's, it allows kids to process, anybody, to process and to, to tell their story through art. And uh, I, I, she just really touched my heart on that one. Back over to Theater Works and Osuna Park. I don't, yes I do. Um, we have new public art over there. And if you haven't seen it, you will be amazed. And thank you to Mary Lou Stevens for really headlining that. It's enormous, like 10 foot musical instruments. And it's touchable art. The kids, kids or anybody, are encouraged to go in and play on it. And they were all over it the other night. It's made out of steel, and they're all percussion. But it was so popular the other night. There were kids just 
hammering away uh, making music. So I think I've touched, oh, I did go on a ride along with our new police chief. Uh, did you have as much fun as I did? He did comment that my district is very diverse. He saw that for himself. And uh, thank you, Acacia. I think I have the most amazing district. And um, that's all for right now. Thank you. Council Member Leone, no comments? Youth Council Liaison Gilbertson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I first just wanted to say that I also went to the Old Town Festival. I volunteered, but uh, my family and my two-week-old niece went, and they had a blast. She got to take photos with um, Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and I also wanted to talk about the upcoming Youth Advisory Board meeting, which is on Tuesday. Um, it's coming up Tuesday, and we're super excited to have Audrina Rosales. Um, she came to the last council meeting, um, give a presentation about flag etiquette, and we're excited to see if we can like help her in any way that we can. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to express my condolences to the entire Leone family on, the, on behalf of the city of Peoria. It is, um, Joan, Joan's absence is a tremendous loss for all of us. Uh, I do want to say that this is our last meeting of the year. 2018 has zoomed by. Uh, thank you to our incredible staff for all of the work that you have done this year, moving the city forward and modernizing us and keeping us on point and on trend all the time, all the time, without fail. Um, you are incredible, and you really make a big, big difference to you know 175,000 people every day. It's a big deal. Uh, so with that, I wish everyone a happy holidays, a happy new year, and we will see you again in January. With that, we are adjourned.